Only the insane have strength enough to prosper. Only those that prosper truly judge what is sane. Oh 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 one one oh one oh one oh oh one 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 oh 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 one 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 one. My savant implant must be acting up, for some reason. Hopefully it is only a technical glitch, and not something else. The else could mean something much worse. Something that money, or thrones as they are called here could not fix. Like a demonic possession. Fortunately, I know I must have blank, like I vaguely remember choosing during my build. Before I was sent here. My father is rather amused at my so-called blessing. For a rogue trader being born as a blank is a boon, unlike back in the empire. And if my children should inherit this trait, our position will become even stronger. Warp incursions would avoid the clan, and thus keep the ship safe. Safe fish. Not everything that wants to kill you is a warp spawn, after all. And here, everything wants to kill you. Rogue traders are a special type of imperial citizen. They receive a lot of freedom and privilege, based on a warrant of trade, which is basically a privateer license to explore and loot outside the Imperium. There are thousands of them, and each has a different agenda, area or preferred method. Some act as missionaries, conquistadors or mere bulk traders. Others deal in Zeno's tech and slaves, or exterminate Zeno's to sell their lands and technology. Some grow beyond a single ship and conquer entire galactic sectors with their own private fleets. Others steal and pirate on the Imperium, or worse they deal with cultists and demons and thus are often killed by Inquisitors or Astartes, or the very demons they trade with. Augur Telemetry confirm the planet sustains life. The missiles heading our way confirm this as well. The census station girl spoke with a faint trace of irony. Linjona Decima. A cousin, if some steps removed. Pretty girl with short black hair, like most of the crew. Hair is hard to keep, in the void. Also, a potential concubine, should the Lord Captain wish it so. And on this vessel, he speaks with the voice of the Emperor. Turn ship to port. Lance batteries target the launch sites. My father orders in a calm voice. I look at him with curious eyes. A tall, heavy set man with glacial blue eyes and a power armor of dubious provenance. He is a conqueror, a build that emphasizes as guest, war. Conquering his own merry kingdom among the distant stars in the eastern fringe. Our ship, the litany for the vanquished is the epitome of a war vessel, armed to the teeth, and the teeth armored to hell. I suspect it has started out as a docile and pleasant light cruiser, before whatever favor my grandfather traded with Forge World Antax was returned in a plethora of advanced tech and upgrades to every possible, and a few impossible systems. Like a choir of tech priests detached to our ship, forever. Lance batteries that would put a heavy cruiser to shame. An armored battalion and a grenadier regiment, all equipped and provisioned by Antax for the next 1011 years. Time has a different value around here. Windows tint as spears of light start flashing, each of them sufficient to obliterate a city or a meter of adamantium armor. Soon enough, our lance guns evaporate the ground missile launchers of the natives, and probably any nearby cities. There is no Geneva Convention in the 40k universe. The Tyranids would likely eat the entire convention as a snack. Then eat the whole world and keep going. In fact, they did just that, on Ocasis. Hive fleet Krakenate whoever didn't manage to fly away. And in this galaxy, you need to be rich or powerful to have a ship. Well, one able to travel the warp at least. There are in-system ships that are much cheaper and easier to acquire. You don't even need a warrant of trade for those. I have one myself, so I know. Technically, you could call the Mona Lisa a shuttle, even if it's larger than a passenger airplane back home. And armed and armored by default. Anything without weapons and armor is only a snack for this evil galaxy. Captain, the ground skaks are human. Shall we conquer this world in the name of the Emperor? The Exo, Master Swedros, asks rhetorically. Of course, we will. We don't carry all those tanks and grenadiers for a pleasure cruise. Their purpose is to fight and die and make us rich. Richer. And if the Emperor is merciful, we might find another relic or ancient tech that we can barter with the Maconicus for. Best guys in this corner of the galaxy, the tech worshippers. As long as you gift them nice stuff. With a metal tentacle waving at my father, the bridge priest signals he has begun his own part. Data and signal warfare. 
a somewhat analog version of ECM. I don't expect the poor natives to rise to the challenge anyway. This is the 46th planet we are pacifying this century. The eastern fringe is rather filled with old era human worlds, mostly devolved into barbarism of some kind. In fact, missiles or other advanced weapons are rare. Maintaining old stocks is difficult, and inventing new stuff almost always leads to suffering. Eternal suffering sometimes. Going back to my work, Captain. Please call me when the landings begin. I say politely and nod to my father. The grizzly warrior smiles proudly and waves me off. He knows I don't like orbital bombardments. They might look clean and neat from orbit, but I've seen the results afterwards. Charred buildings and corpses are not that glorious. As I slink away and salute the marines guarding the armored bridge door, I run another diagnostic on my implant. When you decide to die, remember to give the enemy the same honor. 11 trillion 111 million and 1. Oddly appropriate this time, and assign it's not a mechanical malfunction. Those neuron filaments forming the biological part of the implant are becoming sentient. And possibly stealing data from my own brain. Not sure if that's a heresy or not. Most likely it is. Everything not by the book is heretical after all. And for good reason, as it happens. Machine spirits are actually human souls, cloned and chopped into bits, then used as conduits and processors instead of the worse variant, the abominable intelligences. The demented AI that always, always, always try to genocide everyone. Not that I blame them much. For those not blanks, exposure to warp and its inherent dangers must be like living in hell. Come to think of it, this galaxy might be hell. The outer fringes of it, if the eastern fringes reflect a higher reality. I reach my admec lab and drop into my chair. Praise the Omnissiah, Revelator. What are we working on now? My Mechonicus mentor wonders and tilts its cog head towards me. First, we need to calibrate my brain implant. I keep getting random quotes from a various codex. Then, tank tracks again. I explain in a tiny voice. The tech priest has been mostly polite and nice, for something of his nature. But it might slice me into bits any time, should I make a critical mistake, like those reactor crew engineers did. They didn't suffer long, so at least I know my mentor is not really a sadist. Only disconnected from humanity. There is no truth in flesh, only betrayal. Margus Gyron says with a trace of humor. Yes, he can do jokes and humor just fine. They're merely hard to get sometimes. I was speaking of a broken machine, mentor. My flesh is fine for now. I quit back, and lean my head forward. Without painkillers and any kind of kindness, the Margus opens my skull and peeks inside at my brain. I'm pretty sure I should be fainting in pain, or screaming my lungs out, but I feel only boredom. The operation takes too long. The silver contacts have melted away, and the implant was being oxidized by cerebrospinal fluids. Only the gold connectors are intact. Curious. But then. The tech priest mutters in gothic, maintaining politeness for some strange reason. If my brain gives off enough heat to melt silver, I shouldn't be alive anyway, I said after thinking for a minute. Exactly. There, I've replaced everything with platinum wire. The organic parts seem to grow nicely. You'll become a seventh soon enough, Peff. Margus Gyron replies while gluing my cranium back in place. With glue of some kind, that resorbs into the bone. I've become quite stoic at the strangeness of the machine cult, and their lack of common sense. As the mechadendrites retract from my head, I power on the cogitator on my desk, and project a greenish hologram of a tank drive system. This one is a Chimera personnel carrier tracked vehicle, a standard model among the armies of humanity, in the Astra Militarum and others. Without 3D tools it takes painful and tedious work, to create a template for a mechanical foundry. But it only took three years and we're almost finished. I tap a few keys and open the other version, the original STC template. For someone without technical education, they would look nearly identical. But, both me and Margus Gyron know better. My new version has 36% less moving parts, is 10% more durable has 10% better ground pressure resistance and many other perks. The drive sprockets need to be covered in adamantium, and the torsion bars as well, if possible. 
but even using cheaper materials, the new drivetrain will be revolutionary. Because anything made simpler and more rugged means longer operational times, less maintenance, fewer vehicles lost in transit or during maneuvers. Now combine that with one million army regiments, and a billion war machines. Even if the new tracks increase the Chimera effectiveness by only 5%, although it should be at least 10%, that means 50 million armored vehicles more, to fight the Emperor's enemies. Logistics is the basis of any war, and the Warhammer universe is always at war. If my three years of work provide millions of extra tanks, critical victories might be won. Even if it doesn't lead directly to more victories, the enemies will lose more troops, and then be vanquished later. Jiren observes my work with its mechanical eyes, lenses recording me with something approaching fear. Late into the night, I stop to save my progress, and then make a backup copy on my implant. There is no strength in flesh, only weakness. Oh one 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 oh one 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 oh 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 oh. My implant feeds me another ironic wise quote, as my body fails me and I fall asleep. A minute later, a void guard marine busts in room. Lord Peth. Your presence is required on the bridge. Now. The soldier says in a harsh voice. Not my earliest convenience, then. I run towards the bridge elevator, still half asleep. As I pass other soldiers, they salute me rather startled. Then again, Captain Sun running at full tilt wasn't that common in the main corridor. I usually trained my body in the barracks floor, with all the other grenadiers. Morala's thing, out here. I rush on the bridge, to find it devoid of higher rank officers, only the navigator and a couple of tech priests, with some distant cousins manning the Orspex consoles. Where is the captain? I ask as I force myself to breathe. The navigator scowls and turns to stare at me with all three of his eyes. He doesn't like blanks much, I suspect. That was a joke. I heard suckers have a revulsion towards any blanks, not just me. Lord Peth. Your father left clear orders. In the event of his death, you are to succeed and inherit the warrant. All hail Captain Peth. The navigator proclaims in a psycho voice, a wave of command dispersing the words throughout the ship. With a bewildered face, I fall in the captain's chair, and feel the ship's machine spirit link up with my implant. Victory needs no explanation. Defeat allows none. Oh 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 one 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 oh oh oh. Not the time for quotes damn implant. With a sad sob, I turn to stare at the navigator, while reading the ship logs on my implant. The natives had other advanced weapons. Melty guns, strong enough to burn through ceramite encased power armor. Just like the one former Lord Lance Fire War, as he debarked for another glorious conquest. Well, they probably didn't have the guns anymore. The planet didn't have any cities left now. Launch full occupation, all battalions except the Void Marines. I order with a sad heart. I will have to name this planet now, after it got conquered. Probably something corny, like retribution. The crew would not accept any compromise now, and these guys wouldn't want one either. Not after we killed like a billion of their people. Sins of my father. Slowly, the shock of becoming an orphan, alone in the middle of a hostile galaxy worn off as my mind concentrated on the important goal of survival. I had to prove myself a worthy ship captain, a skilled rogue trader and at least a decent general for my small army. Otherwise, I would find myself kicked out from an airlock, with the ship's navigator finally happy to be rid of my blank aura. Not that my aura works like normal blanks do. I read they create instant hostility into anyone with a soul, or at least a minimal warp presence, something humanity has in spades. Feeling your soul getting absorbed into a menacing black hole would explain the hostility, perhaps. Luckily, I am not one of those natural and rare pariahs. My gift is bland and merely protects myself from the warp, something which confuses those more sensitive to the warp, but doesn't burn their soul. Of course, it also protects me from astropaths, telepaths and diviners, as well as other potential troubles like demonic possession and all those visions or dreams so common among the crew. Not that I need visions to plan ahead. Somehow, I remember perfectly everything I've seen of this universe in my previous life, although the order of the events is sometimes different. I have my own theories why this happens, maybe my memories got scrambled, or some local deity plays with time, 
or the emperor himself dreams on his golden throne and changes things, perhaps subconsciously. I do recall the existence of a special inquisition order, Ordo Kronos, that investigates timeline manipulations. And there are other beings around that play with time, be they Necron or Catan, Eldar or Ud. But for now, I focus on the task at hand, proving my genius and savant status, by using my expensive implants to run the logistics of a planetary invasion from my captain's command chair. I am also very lucky and do not fail. The conquest of retribution lasted merely months. Then again, we had a cruiser in orbit, five kilometers of guns, armor and cathedrals, too able and willing to impart retribution on these heretics. Paired with their superiority via our fighter squadron, and liberal use of Maconicus new sphere magic, the ground-locked enemies were rapidly corralled and captured, or killed if they resisted. Either way, the planet provided fresh replenishments for the depleted lower decks, new serfs and other lower servitor castes being inducted, stamped and cyborgized into more useful forms. I even convinced Margus Gyron to begin installing servitors as targeting heads for our long-range torpedoes. It took a dozen trials, but now our long-range weapons could turn and attempt homing while the propellant lasted. The efficiency increase was over 300% this time, but sadly my own area of control was limited by the warrant. Back in Empire space, my words were feeble and likely without any true power, but here on my ship, I now spoke with the voice of the Emperor. Something even the Maconicus cult was not likely to defy, just like every other members of the crew or the military we carried. It will take a few more generations before the regiment fully transformed from an auxiliary Maconicus unit to my own household regiment, but my father had already began that plan, replacing sergeants and corporals with loyal soldiers, sending difficult officers on long-range reconnaissance and other dangerous missions. I didn't want to stir things too much with the grenadiers, but I did want a proper armored regiment if it was possible. My clan was rich, very rich. I could afford to pay for new machines and equipment from my clan's budget, if we really needed to. I named Lord Swedros, my father's exo as planetary governor on retribution, and gave him all the old chimeras, half the new servitors and a grenadier battalion formed by the least loyal troops, as well as one orbit-capable shuttle. The guy seemed rather pleased at his new post, and probably thankful I didn't simply space him. That was the tradition after a captain change among rogue traders. But I didn't want to waste a competent guy, simply because I didn't like or trusted him. He could still be useful, making retribution productive again, in a few decades. We head to Antax now, I'll need my warrant ratified and some new equipment. I told my new bridge crew, still mostly clan members but with an engine seer and a more pliable Auspex tech priest added in for extra points of view. I knew I could get away with minor quirks, and myself being mentored by a Maconicus Margus was no secret among the clan. Not that anyone could tell we were related just by looking at us. Genetic diversity in the galaxy was enormous, and Grandfather had over thirty wives during his millennium-long life. My father had been more conservative, with only half that many wives, including my own mother that nobody knew where she had come from, and where she had gone. I had a few pics of her platinum hair and green eyes, and a rumor she was a witch. Probably a blank, if I think on it. Still a witch, but the good kind in my view. Keeping away the warp was a nice gift she gave me. I had a strange feeling I will meet her again, but hopefully not from the other end of an Exodus rifle. The Vindic assassins are rather famous for training blanks, after all. Back in my mechanical lab, I go over a few more projects all of them attempting to simplify and enhance imperial technology with varied degrees of success and heresy. We have a handheld melter gun to analyze and rebuild, the standard template Lars gun, an Auspex sensor based on lasers, and my masterpiece, the tri-barrel multi-laser. The Lars gun is rather hard to improve cheaply. The Emperor himself had worked on this weapon for years, and he is rather smarter than me. Sure. Expensive capacitors and high-definition lenses can improve the gun significantly. The reverse is rather hard, dumbing down the weapon will not make it better. I do have two minor fixes that will increase the Lars guns' lethal range by 10 meters and power pack's capacity by 5%. Jiren is quite amazed at the simple solutions I found and has vowed to support the new retribution template in front of his Maconicus peers. That's our story, and we will stick to it.
ancient STC patterns, discovered by a famous rogue trader. Highly effective, considering the rogue trader paid with his life for the discovery. The Auspex sensors are a type of LiDAR, and by increasing photon density and collimating the beam by a few microns, we extend range and definition by 7%. Nothing huge, until you consider the trillions of such sensors installed on nearly every war machine in the Empire. The new multi-laser is nothing so simple. At first, I simply tried adding a new barrel for extra cooling and a minor rate of fire. But somehow, moving the cooling coiling into a new pattern increased not only the rate of fire, but penetration and range by 25%. It is almost like geometric magic. Separating the barrels even further doesn't work, and instead reduces the damage. It is the polarization, Captain. Turning the mechanism by 45 degrees, it increases lenses reflection, as fewer photons pass through the focus mirror. Thus, less heating and better penetration. Gyron concludes after trying the same orientation with a normal two-barrel multi-laser, and replicating my results. I shrugged in defeat. I bow to your wisdom, mentor. These ancient humans were so clever, right? You think me foolish, but all knowledge is manifestation of deity. The Emperor was learned indeed, and that's why we are allied now. But, as his voice you improved his works too. Thus, Omnissiah flows though you. The priest commented in a serious tone. I hummed in deep thought at that. Religion was a serious thing here, more so for those exposed to the immaterium, unlike me. Our navigator cannot sense the Astronomicon so far away. He locks on Ultramar instead, and works well enough. Though I still want to get a look inside those Geller generators once we are in dock. I mused out loud. The Margus waved a few metallic tentacles in warning. You should really not. This may be your ship, but those that stare into the warp, they get stared back at. But if we are in real space, it should be safe, right? I wonder for argument's sake. Nowhere is truly safe, silly boy. And inside a Gellerfield generator, much lesser than anywhere else. Even your blank aura isn't sufficient. When we assemble, well, I better not speak of it. But there's a reason only higher ranked priests can enter them, Jaren continued in a calm tone, while producing a dozen vials of scented oils and incense burners to sanctify the new multi laser. Normally, I would dismiss such things as superstition or stupidity. Until your own weapon grows fangs and tries to eat you. Sometimes happens, during traveling the warp. Not so much with sanctified weapons. I still have a scar on my forearm from my first laser pistol that became sentient or maybe emotional. And bit me. Did I mention how machine spirits are made from cloned human tissue? Well, humanity is the Emperor's domain in the warp. Including the amputated ones. The Mechonicus have rapidly learned the trick, and have used this knowledge to great effect to protect all their machinery from the warp using human cells and nerves as conduits for the Emperor's protection. Emperor protects, is the most commonly used phrase among humans. Because he really does. Just not in the mundane world, not unless he raises a saint or sends the Legion of the Damned to intervene directly. But those things are so rare that they are myths and legend anyway. Sometimes I wonder how the Emperor sees me, while under this blank cover. Then again, I do have humans' genes. It's possibly blood magic or something like that, for a high-level entity like the God Emperor of Mankind. That Eldar Tentacle Warp God does kind of the same thing, in reverse. Targeting all Elders for more excess and shit. Stay strong Adam. One day I will reach Terra and try to fix your chair. This galaxy needs you. I whispered in my mind watching the familiar gestures of the Maconicus priest painting my projects with holy oils. Not too soon though. I still had lots of things to do, out here outside the Empire. Mentally, I began preparing contingencies for the Forge underscore world visit, and various trade protocols left behind by my dear grandfather, who seemed to be good friends with the Fabricator General. Probably a whole bucket of crap, the famous friendship. But if it worked once, it should work again. As long as I brought nice gifts, the trip through the warp was relatively safe and quick, three weeks for those on board, and six months for the galaxy. Losses on the lower decks remained under 2%, which meant we will not need to restock of Gellerfield consumables, whatever they were. Gyron tells me we only need to worry at 6% loses. For now, I have no choice but to believe him, 
and hope for the best. The Meconicus uses the same type of generator as my upgraded cruiser, and they rarely vanish during trips, unlike the local navy ships which tend to encounter problems on every single patrol. Forge World Antax is a dead world, since nobody bothers with environmental laws around here. The pollution and radiation alone would kill unarmored humans in minutes. That's only on the surface though. Deep underground, the cult Meconicus lives in enclosed tunnels and caves like ants. It also has a ring of orbital shipyards and thousands of mining or transport ships to supply the forges with metals or organic components. The litany itself carries a million spare parts of organic origin, and could always come round with more. Human resources are plentiful in the galaxy, and we only need to wait a few decades for more such resources to regenerate on their own, then visit a conquered planet to harvest more. We send codes and passwords, as well as the electronic warrant ahead, to avoid being atomized by some zealous priest. Our void shields stay up, and the void marines are on full alert anyway. That was among the first things I did as the new captain. Three companies of marines are now always posted around the bridge, reactor and Magella generator. Another company patrols the lower decks, in fully enclosed suits and backed up by twice as many combat servitors. A couple AFVs are also deployed with them, to provide some armor support in case of need. I have also begun to slowly increase the surf's food rations in quantity and quality, but I can only do so much, and not annoy the traditionalists among the crew, who would rather dispense burning Prometheum instead of clean water and decent food. I had to explain to them how much costly Prometheum is compared to water. Don't spend my thrones when is not needed, guys. Water is cheap, so we give the surf's water. Afraid they might get be penalized from their shares for every munition they spend to quell revolts or mutinies, the officers had temporarily agreed to try their humane option first, if it was cheapest. After a day of waiting, my cruiser is finally allowed to dock and refuel in an orbital dock, as I am escorted towards the fabricator general with all the new discoveries. Sadly, the retribution pattern melter gun is not reproducible by our onboard forge but I expect the Meconicus priests will equip a few companies with licensed guns for free. We cannot simply buy stuff from the cult, but trading favors is not only accepted but the only way to acquire Meconicus level weapons or technology. Sure, technically the Meconicus is obliged by treaty to provide weapons freely to every ship and regiment, but the waiting list is longer than my cruiser. I rather skip ahead by providing a worthy gift. Lord Peth, Captain of the Litany of the Vanquished. The Fabricator General will see you now. A red-robed tech priest says in gothic, and glares at me with blue lenses cyborg eyes. Thank you, Margus. I answer and enter the study, and notice that Jiren has been halted by the other Margus for a friendly chat in binary. A monstrous construct receives me, not even a hint of organic origin left. Dozens of tentacles and arms, at least thirty weapons I can detect and probably twice as many I do not. So you are the famous blank trader. What do you want for those patterns? The fabricator priest asks me in fluent gothic. I blink confused. The protocols are burned already. They are gifts. If every forge world also receives them, once they pass your tests, fabricator. I answer in a level voice. That is the crux of the problem. Forge worlds tend to be secretive and jealous, guarding tech like religious relics. The fabricator holds still for a second, which should mean hours of accelerated thought for someone of his powers. Denied. Even if I could accept these gifts, dissemination of holy knowledge is reserved for Mars. The head priest answers in a slow voice. Angry maybe? I see. Sector wide, perhaps? Surely nearby forge worlds will be interested in new patterns, and offer some of their own in return. I muse to myself and turn round to examine the fabricator's study. Weapons and fragments of them, scrolls and codex glowing with arcane symbols reminding me of quantum physics formulas. They probably are exactly that, and more. So, it is true. You are trying to spread these advanced patterns, even at cost to yourself. Jaren wasn't wrong, after all. The priest mutters while poking a cogitator and running some high-speed simulations, possibly for my sake. I try to store everything on my remembrance implant, but I fail. Too much data, too fast. But I get the gist of it. Hive fleets Kraken and Behemoth attacking the sector, and logistical needs to supply everyone with new weapons. 
Not possible of course, going by the plethora of red errors and yellow alerts. I hum in deep thought, powering up the seventh implant for a minute. There is no miracle solution, of course. The empire has been slowly dying for 10,000 years, and every single part of the government is corrupt to hell. Still, Hydra tanks, armed with a new multi-laser pattern, maybe even new tracks and sensors. Same thing for medium-grade Skatari troops. Melty guns, if you manage to reproduce them. The Skatari are cyborg soldiers for the Mechonicus, and good ones. Their elites can match space marines in some scenarios. But if we could upgrade the medium ones, which number in the millions? Gambit SK-2-33. I suppose we could try it with a few regiments and compare their new efficiency for cost. But ground troops are all presumed destroyed once a hive lands. The fabricator says with a dismissive gesture. So, he had already considered it. Of course, he has. This guy is basically the closest thing to an AI, this side of the galaxy. Ships take too long to build. I mutter in defeat. There are never enough ships, and a hive has millions of ship-grade organisms able to overwhelm any defensive fleet the Navy, or the Mechonicus can gather in a short time. The fabricator stares at me with glowing eyes. Something more then? Cheaper ships, maybe? I wonder out loud. It's close to heresy, but not really. Yes, many radical priests argue the same. Millions of low-quality ships to stem the tide. Millions of times weaker too. The fabricator says with a doubtful voice. The Imperial Guard. I argue with a shrug. Humanity throws trillions of poorly armed soldiers to stem the tide. Sometimes it works. Sometimes they need space marines or titans to help them. Sometimes, nothing is enough. Jaren speaks well of you, Lord Peth. Very well. We will try it for 101 years, when the Hive Fleet Kraken is expected to arrive at Brimlock. Iridium tungsten armor, mechanical Geller fields, and cheap plasma engines. You will provide the officers, and we provide tech priests and servitors for gunnery. The priest says in a not too pleased voice, I feel I was given a test and a quest here, but I'm not smart enough to figure everything out. I'll need to ask Jiren. Great. Meanwhile, I thought of what I might need to go back beyond the Empire. An armored regiment, with a few low-level titans for support. And a few escort ships, if there are any to spare. Training officers works better if they can experience real missions. I quip in a friendly voice. I wonder if my grandfather had the same experience here. The fabricator waves a few mechadendrites to signify something. Perhaps anger? I have a sword class underscore frigate that isn't covered by an adamantium hard contract. Titans are excluded. A dozen transport void ships with servitor crew. Now, for an armored regiment, we can empty a stasis block and extract two bane blades and a storm blade. A thousand lesser vehicles, half of them hydras and three stormbird attack landers to deploy the heavy safely. Is that enough, Lord Peth? The fabricator asks in pleasant tone. I'm not certain what it means, but I fear is not something good. Still, it seems the new multi-laser was truly valuable. A brand new frigate, and armored regiment? Including those bane blades. I almost agree, before I catch myself. Gellerfield generators? Could you install these mechanical Geller fields on the Stormbirds? Makes sense to protect such relics, should something happen in transit. I ask in a level voice. Yes, yes. It will be done, and make us start the new fabrication line much sooner. Come back in three years or so. The priest says and waves me off with a metal arm. I walk outside and exhale deeply. The meeting was rather fruitful, but so tense and tiring. Jaren waves at me in a friendly gesture. Steel of body. Steel of mind. 111,001,111,111. Damn it. I thought I have fixed the implant. While the Antax Forge World is preparing their gifts for me, I decide to visit another Forge World called Grier. It's pretty close as things go, two weeks of travel time and hopefully would result in more barter for ancient tech, perhaps even a few titans. Meanwhile, I try to spend more time with my officers and crew, even having meals together and discuss options for the future. Decimar proves to be a pleasant surprise, a freethinker and competent space tactician, 
coming up with a plan to overwhelm mass Tyranid void ships with a massive barrage of long-range torpedoes. It's not a new tactic, but implementing it necessitates good coordination between our future ships, as torpedoes are not friendly fire. My new engine seer bridge officer, called Sigma 099 or Cygnus, provides another tactic, blowing up the reactor of a disposable ship, like those transport vessels we're about to receive. The navigator is not convinced, since opening the warp might destroy some Tyranid ships but release a host of demons or enslavers out into the galaxy instead. We'll prepare one such sacrificial fire ship for the low chance of taking out a Hive Queen. If we get the chance, it would be worth it. Otherwise, no. I decide after a minute of computing and estimating risks on my Savant implant. Cygnus nods in acceptance, while the navigator scowls at me like always. At least you have some sense. The Psychonoble mutters to himself. Soon enough, we arrive at Gryar, to find them preparing for evacuation. They had a diadem-like array of battle stations in orbit, arranged such that the entire forge could move and travel to another system. Well, such preparations would take years anyway, even with thousands of landers lifting their machines from the surface. Another tense meeting, while I give them a twin-linked version of my multi-laser and an ultraviolet-based Torspex sensor. I simply replaced the normal beam of the LiDAR detector with a homemade UV laser, but such a simple conversion has immense utility, as the Orspex will now detect camouflaged enemies and many hidden troubles like mines or traps. Then I deliver them poisoned apple, under the guise of having been used by our enemies. My friend and mentor, Margus Gyron has deduced that those barbarians that killed my father might have used servitors or some kind of cyborg unit to target their missiles. No other way could have they been so accurate and able to home in on the ship and shuttles. The fabricator general freezes while he considers my words. Just like I do, when diving deep in the Savant implant. You mean, piloted missiles? He asks to make sure. I just nod, afraid to give myself away. The fabricator might have a way to sense lies or something. Makes me wonder if they had an STC cache on that fringe planet. Perhaps your Lord Father should have investigated in more detail, before starting the orbital bombardment. He says in a regretful voice. I kinda agree, the contact with those natives had been violent from the start. Even if they fired first. Well, we did find a few more patterns, but I gifted them to forge Antax since they sponsored us with tanks and a grenadier regiment. I answer with a hint of more bartering in the future. The fabricator nods its cyborg head, and turns on his cogitator, scrolling through a list of possible gifts of his own. My eyes record the list, by the grace of the remembrance implant, and I start picking and choosing what I want from their trading cache. A dozen mining barges, another bane blade, another fighter squadron. The fabricator doesn't offer tech priests or servitors, but then I do have plenty of those anyway. And he probably knows that already. I mark the gifts I want and wait. You're very frugal, for a rogue trader. The Margus observes and seemed unhappy. So I should have gained more. I try to maintain a cohesive force, with same type of equipment for better logistical support and repairs. It serves me less to take flamer tanks without a Prometheum refinery. Same with heavy bolters or basilisk artillery, as there are no Munitorum depots outside the Empire space. I tell him with a shrug. It is also true. No ammunition factories out there, among the barbarians and Xenos. The fabricator general sighs, in almost human manner. Yes, I suppose so. What would you need, when you go back exploring the wild fringes? He asks in a more resigned voice. Heavy tanks. Titans, torpedoes, and a way to build missiles. Millions of missiles. I answer truthfully. Beam weapons are great, but they have limited effective range. Missiles and torpedoes have ten times the range. Even Antax wouldn't give you Titans. It's simply not possible, but I guess you're young and hopeful. I will add two more Bane Blades then. As for missiles, I will provide you 2,000 Hunter Seeker launchers and a million crack missiles. No factory or ship-based forge though. Not outside the Empire. The Margus proclaims with a wave of tentacles, getting close to his final line then. Crack missiles are not very useful in ship-to-ship -ship combat, but the launchers can be installed on fighters and tanks. They even come with Logi engines inside. And a million crack missiles should last me for a 100 years, unless I fight a Tyranid swarm or something. 
Antax is building cheap ships to fight the Tyranid Hive. Iridium tungsten armor and mechanical geller fields. I announce as I leave. Then I walk away briskly, as something crashes inside the fabricator's quarters. Loading up the missiles and the tanks doesn't take long, since Gryer was already evacuating, fleeing from the path of Hive Fleet Kraken. A sensible thing to do, in my view. They couldn't hope to stop it, even with a whole Maconicus fleet in orbit. They might have a few battleships and battle cruisers and escorts by the hundred, but a tiny splinter of the hive would still win. However, I planted the seed, under the guise of providing news and gifts. Next stop, Forge World Tigris. This is a major Forge World, with many unique STC designs like the Vanquisher Cannon and the Fellblade Heavy Tank. I want some of those. Travel time is longer, six more weeks of warp immersion and the lower deck causalities reach 5% now. Time to restock on those black box consumables for our Geller field generator. Already the crew complain of hearing whispers and having nightmares. During flight, I complete an infrared or specs sensor, and three variants of the multi-laser in various sizes, including fighter and frigate sized guns. Another, even simpler design for the tank tracks, with wider tracks made of adamantium and even less moving parts. Tigris is a rich forged world, they can afford using adamantium for higher quality products. They seem to have recovered nicely from being overrun by orcs a few millennia ago. I gift them my STC patterns and spread the news, and the fabricator general is rather pleased. Thus, I am promised another sword class frigate in 10 years, and gifted 4 fell blades and 12 Lehman Rust tanks with Vanquisher cannons. I don't ask for Titans anymore, because it's clear I will never get any. Makes me look naive too, which is not recommended for a rogue trader. Even one barely out of his teens. A transport ship loaded with more crack missiles and a hundred torpedoes will be prepared and sent to Antax in two years, when I plan to depart to the eastern fringes again. But the nicest gift is a working Geller generator without organic parts, and its own tech priest crew. I plan to install this thing near the reactor core on my cruiser, and hopefully reduce the risks of warp travel malfunctions. And I also want to scan and learn how it works, because demons. And during this cruise, Decima decides she wants to be my first wife. I am a young man and rather grateful for her gift. We hold a wedding and invite everyone of rank all officers and priests and commissars and have a great feast. You were born in the shadow of the Omnissiah. Oh 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 one oh 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 one oh oh. I'm not sure what the machine spirit means, but I take it as a blessing. The shadow could mean the blank, or something else. Still, I began to suspect Margus Gyron has a macadendrite in this implant quoting stuff affair. He has been the only one poking inside my head after all. Then again, I am somewhat smarter and wiser now. It might be the growing up, the responsibility of being the captain and dealing with command prerogatives every day. But it might be something else. If only I could remember what I picked on my damn build. Is the being that brought me here the Omnissiah? That would be a great cosmic joke, right? Anyway, time to enjoy my wedding night, and the pretty wife. Decima has short black hair and Asian eyes, and she seems to like me a little. Hopefully it will grow into love. We both do our best, and fall asleep exhausted a few hours later. Meanwhile, we depart for Metallica Forge World, the last part of the gift cruise before we return to Antax. For the next barter, I prepare larger things. An X-ray laser or specs pattern that needs a ship-sized reactor to scan the void for enemies. Also, tri-barrel laser cannons, that have larger range and damage. Also fire faster by 10% due to less overheating. As it happens, Metallica was building a large order of Cobra-class destroyers, at least 20 hulls laid down and completed to various degrees. I will receive the first two of these torpedo boats when they are ready, probably in eight years. Then I load up three more Bayon blades and another fighter squadron, piloted by cyborg servitors. A thousand more hunter-killer launches, but no missiles. Still, I get gifted 20 new torpedoes so it's all good. My torpedoes launches are full again, which makes me feel safer. We wait a month for the first X-ray or specs to be produced and installed on my cruiser, as well as 100 hunter-killer launches, mostly on the ventral side, to serve as close defense against boarding shuttles or for planetary pacification. As I leave, 
I notice an empty dock being prepared to construct smaller ships, with a single adamantium beam for reinforcement. You think the fabricator listened? I wonder out loud, looking at the view screen with hope. Jiren walks beside me and measures the incipient shape of the corvette-sized skeleton. Just over one kilometer long. Barely enough to support warp travel. The longitudinal beam will provide support for high-G maneuvers and acceleration, as well as some resistance to ramming. But only one dock, so it's merely a curiosity test. The Margus answers after a minute. I sigh and turn away. Changing the traditions of an ossified empire is not easy. But even a small ship is a start. I would have a hundred such ships around every planet if I could. Then every single invasion would need to be much bigger, which would give the Navy warning and time to assemble their battleships. That means one hundred million ships for the Imperium, so it's not very likely. I now have thirteen Bane Blades or variants, enough to create a heavy armor company for my regiment. Ideally I should use twenty of them for better results, but Bane Blades don't grow on trees. Then, I'll have a dozen Lehman Rust tanks and Chimeras and Hydras for support and air cover. I am happy with what I have right now, once my tech priests install hunter-killer launchers on every armored vehicle and void fighter. And once my escorts are ready, they will receive upgraded sensors and missile launchers as well, in the hope of providing protection against fighters and bombers or assault shuttles. There is a pirate empire I know about, from the fars left by my father. And while they have perhaps a dozen ships and hundreds of void fighters they are not that dangerous if we're prepared. If I catch them spread out, I can defeat them in detail. But if they have some relic battleship, even half operational, then it would be quite bad. I need to be bold and aggressive however. A chaos incursion might turn those pirates into demon worshippers, and then I wouldn't have anything to salvage. At best I would push the desecrated ships into a sun, or something. At worst, I would get my crew eaten by a demon prince or such. My clan has always avoided corrupted worlds, knowing their limits and aiming for easier conquests. There are also Xenos out there, Tao and Bangasi and her and many others. The Forge worlds would gladly examine their technology and reward us greatly, but I don't have a crusade behind me. Three years have passed in the galaxy while we cruised a few Forge worlds and acquired weapons for the next conquest. At Antax, my gifts are ready. The new sword class frigate, and a dozen transport ships, loaded with food, and construction equipment of many kinds. Also, the armored regiment with a thousand new tech priests of lower rank, that will maintain and repair the vehicles. We stay here a few months, while everything is getting up armed and upgrades, and new tank crews trained. The frigate came with only a skeleton crew, a navigator, two astropaths and perhaps one thousand tech priests, engineers and servitors. I split off my own officer corps and appoint a new captain for the Requiem for the Vanquished. As it happens, this guy is a half-brother from a different mother, with some experience in boarding and other void combat. Probably my replacement, if I fail to please my father for a worthy successor of the warrant. Captain Varian Tertius, has brown hair and blue eyes, and looks vaguely similar to father. Which is probably normal. The Requiem flies around the system for a test drive, fires the lance batteries at a dozen asteroids and doesn't explode on the during testing, which is great. We depart for retribution, and the rest of the upgrades are finished during the warp travel. Myself and Jaren monitor the new Geller generator, and record every fluctuation. The warp radiation can be measured somewhat, with the kind psychic reactive sensors of the Mechanicum. But the mechanical generator doesn't drop below the safety limit during this trip. Still, it only takes once. When demons and apparitions flood the ship in a second of integrity failure, pretty much everyone on board will get corrupted, starting with the navigator, then the astropaths, and then everyone else. I might last the longest, thanks to my blank aura, but that won't save me from manifested demons with claws and tails that can rip ceramite to shreds. Margus Irredent Surge has indeed given you a quest, Captain. Because the new ships will be vulnerable to the Immaterium, more than normal, he wants blanks for officers. And possibly blank tissues for the machine spirits. Jaren reveals when I do ask. Damn it. I'll need hundreds of concubines, to obtain thousands of blank officers for those ships. And clones for organic parts, if blanks can be cloned. I need to ask Decimar what to do. 
using my bed skills to save the sector from being eaten by Tyranids, and resist the chaos as well, now that I think of it. Then again, the Emperor had twenty sons given the same task. Every Forge world has tiny quirks and updates hidden in their construction, and a couple of them are made on Mars. I magnify the schematics to the maximum and power up my implants. Extra memory and thinking speed will help. A minute later I reach the memory limit and leave the deep dive. Then I close my eyes and enter the trance-like meditation I learned from my mentor. Superimposing the designs, and figuring out what changed and how. Some modifications make no logical or structural sense, moving parts added for religious or symbolic reasons, side sponsons that expose the tank to huge danger for minimal extra firepower. Energy conduits for laser guns on the outside of the main armor, and hundreds of other design flaws. In my opinion anyway. They possibly changed the original design for easier access or due to lack of spare parts. Maybe battlefield repairs. All these tanks have seen combat and carry the scars proudly. Even if that scar is now a weak point and would likely result in crew death the first time a large shell or other weapon hits the damaged side. The Stormblade, with its plasma cannons is the most advanced model, and could theoretically wear down a Titan. Once I dissect and learn how the thing works, I might upgrade all the Bane Blades to that model. The Fell Blades are nice, their accelerator cannons have a dual role by design, both versus infantry or armored enemies as needed. But nice is not enough, because the ammunition is expendable, and I cannot produce the advanced shells in the ship's forge. Instead, I will try and learn how to make atomantic arc reactors like they have, and replace their cannons with the plasma cannons of the Stormblade. This will take decades anyway. Advanced relics are not easy to copy, even by the largest forge worlds. And the tech priests are really smart, even if trapped by ritual and tradition. One fell blade is set aside for this task same as the Stormblade. The heavy company will have to do with 11 super heavy tanks and 11 Lehman Russ vanquishers, and the vanquisher other is set aside too, for reverse engineering. We return to retribution to find it much the same, although most of the dust from the bombardments has settled and all the injured or sick people have already died. Evolution at work, some might say. Lack of medicine or care, I argue with a tiny voice inside. The transport ships begin unloading their construction machines and servitors, and thousands of tech priests begin rebuilding the planet for me. We set up a dozen small forges to repair and produce more equipment, and my faithful bridge tech priest is nominated Fabricator General for Retribution. As it happens, here I speak with the voice of the Emperor, and as such I am obeyed. It is a great feeling, I admit. Religious people make great subjects, especially when they see you as their prophet or holy spirit. Because the Emperor is not only the temporal leader of the Imperium of Man, but also their god. Sure, poor Adam doesn't do much rule these days, being entombed in his golden throne while the nobles and inquisitors do things in his name, much like I am. And lastly, my wife Decima learned of my Antax Fabricator quest and agreed to help, bearing my children and selecting concubines to bear more. She is now expecting our first child, and the navigator says he will be a blank, while gritting his teeth in displeasure. Lord Duras, a blank child will not be exposed to the temptations of the warp. And I expect psychers will have a hard time reading his mind or future. Isn't this great for a ship captain? I ask him in a mild voice. The navigator sighs. Perhaps you are right, Lord Peth. I wouldn't wish on anyone my own gift and torment. Staring into the warp to navigate the ship must be harsh. We drink a glass of expensive wine, and then return to our own duties. I am training a new cadet class of clan kids, both male and female. Daily lessons are then applied on the frigate and the transport ships, while they patrol the system and practice scans and live fire on asteroids or comets. I aim to produce a thousand new officers in a decade, because I will get new ships and will need people to operate them. The armored regiment trains on the ground, pushing the tanks and personnel carriers to the limit, and finding what can be improved, both on maneuver warfare or assault tactics. Defense is much easier, but if you need to use tanks in defense something has gone wrong anyway.